Call call your first witness. (laughs) Uh, State calls Nicholas LaFleur. Sir, please. uh, Raise your right hand. You swear for under penalty of law that the testimony you give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, have a seat. Talk into the microphone. Sure. Rules and books. I'm sorry? With regard to the uh, invocation of the rule, um, our case agent is in the is in the room. We just wanted to put that on the record. The, the, the prosecutor indicated that they'd be calling the case agent early in the case. So given that, I, I did, did not continue my objection I had earlier to her being present. Thank you. Case agents allowed in. <laughs> Sir. State, state your name and spell your last name for the court record, please. My name is Nicholas LaFleur. My last name is spelled L-E-F-L-E-U-R. And how are you currently employed? The City of Santa Fe Police Department. And what do you do there? Police officer. How long have you been employed at the City of Santa Fe? Two years. Can everyone hear Officer LaFleur? Okay. Um, and prior to working for the Santa Fe Police Department, uh, did you work anywhere else? Yes, ma'am. Where did you work? The Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department. And how long did you work at the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Department? About two years. And were you on duty on October 21st of 2021? Yes. Did you receive a dispatch call? Yes. Can you tell us what, what you received and what you did? Um, a call came in that there was someone shot at a movie set. Um, unclear who shot, how many were shot. I happened to be the closest person to the call and arrived on scene first. So when you arrived on scene, when you say first, were there other law enforcement officers there? No. Not at the time when I got there. Uh, Were there any other um, first responders present? There were some fire fire personnel and what they called the scene medic for the uh, movie movie set, I guess. You said a scene medic? Yeah. Okay. So when you, let let me ask you, when you receive a call uh, for a shooting, What's your primary concern? Priority life. And what do you and mean when you say priority life? Uh, make sure um, per- whoever needs help gets help and that the, the threat is stopped. And when you arrived on the, the scene, and where was it? Um, uh, Bonanza Creek. Um, movie set, I guess it's it's quite a ways off the interstate. Okay. Um, and what uh, county and state is that in? Santa Fe County, um, state of New Mexico. Okay. Uh, so when w- when you arrived there, g- give us an idea of what you saw. What was going on? Um, it was a big old um, like cowboy western theme like city or a town. There's a bunch of people running everywhere. Um, Bunch of cars, a um, bunch of people pointing. Um, when I got there, uh, people were pointing towards a, a church. Um, and I got out and I attempted to grab my medical bag and went in and saw. Hey, hang on, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there. Uh, approximately how many people were there on scene? I don't have the direct number, but there was more than 100 people. Um, have you ever been called uh, to a shooting where there were a hundred people already on scene? No. Um, did that present any specific challenges for you? Yes. Ex- explain to us what those challenges were. Um, just there's a lot of moving parts. Um, just got to take it one one piece at a time. See who's hurt. Um, 
make sure that one, that nobody's continually getting hurt. And then two, the person who's hurt, um, medical attention is being given to them and then go from there. Okay. Um, and when you arrived on scene that day, uh, were you running your body worn camera? Yes. Uh, the state moves for the admission of state's exhibit four. No further objections, Your Honor. Do I be are you, are you I want to just make sure I'm connected. I'm ready to play it. Right. Permission to publish? Was well, he going to recognize it first? Or have, are you satisfied with the foundation? Yes, Your Honor. We've consented to both the la la lapel videos All right, today. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So you may publish. This is a state one. Four. Four. How do I get the monitors to come on? This one's not. It's on, but it's green light. Green light's on. Let me go get the factory. Well, can he redo it from here while he's looking? Or do you want? Sure, if the monitor won't just come on. He's got to get the adapter. Go get the adapter. Okay. Uh, Officer LaFleur, do you want to turn around and, and just look at the monitor on the wall behind you? It doesn't matter, man. Okay, let's do that. You got your, you got your tonic kit? Yeah, I'm trying to heat it up. This stupid new truck. I'll be inside with the medium. Officer LaFleur, tell us, t tell us what's going on in the video right now. Um, I'm looking for my other medic bag. I handed the individual a trauma pack um, for shooting, and I'm attempting to open a, um, one of the storage boxes and, in the back of the truck. Who, who was the individual that you handed something to? Um, the, I believe it was a fire per fire personnel that I followed in, a volunteer firefighter maybe. And I, I thought I heard uh, the word. Is it BVM? Um, it's it's for CPR. It's a bag valve mask. Bag so, valve yeah, mask. BVM. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> She came in here and went across her chest. Okay. You want air, air flight? Yeah, we all went in route. Okay. And what are you talking about there when you say air flight? Um, uh, 
helicopter that's designed to transport people that need advanced treatment faster than ambulance? It's a helicopter that air paramedics basically. Uh, did you call for the helicopter or, or did someone else do that? Do you know? Um, that individual said that they had already called one, but I, I called one for his one as well. You I'm called also? Yes, ma'am. And why did you feel that it was necessary to have a helicopter arrive? Someone who was shot across the chest. We're quite a ways out for an ambulance to, in reference to where the hospital is, so. And when you say you were quite a ways out, how, how far away is Bonanza Creek? From a hospital? Sure. Um, running lights and sirens, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes or more. Okay. Thirty-two Santa Fe. One female shot in the chest. Male shot in the stomach. Request an air flight. Request an air flight. I heard you there saying male shot in the stomach. Is that what you said? I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't really hear it. Um, well, as you sit here today, do you recall? Uh, where the other person was shot? Somewhere in the chest. Okay. Or shoulder area. Thank you. Uh, 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 it's okay. Thank right you. I got uh, just Santa Fe medics. In your video, sir, can you identify who the set medic is? Uh, it's a little blurry, but I believe it's this lady, right? Um, the one that's bent over with her blondish brown hair. Is the monitor working now? Yeah. Yes. This monitor is working now. Oh, it is. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do, do, you know, do you know how to touch it to, to put it? There you go. Thank no. you. I appreciate you. You can go ahead and remove that. Oh, I don't know how to remove it. How to, can you show them how to remove it? Oh, uh, push on the menu button. Clear. And then there's a clear view. Okay. Then if it's in the way, just push the menu. Do you know who these other people are that are in the room? No. I know that uh, that person, that person, and somebody over here, um, the battalion chief, they were wearing Santa Fe medic. Uh, county fire medic shirts. So, and they came in in the, the vehicle in front of me. You don't know who the other people are that are in the room? Um, I know the other person shot, and then um, Elena Hutchins, or I didn't maybe misspelled her name or pronounced it, and then the uh, other assistant director, and that's about it. Okay. Um, and you mentioned that, that there was a, a, a truck pulling in ahead of you. It was a volunteer firefighter truck. So did the first responders that we see here in this scene, did they arrive about the same time you did? Yes. <laughs> Thirty-two Santa Fe, both approximately 140 pounds. Elderly male and young female. What do you need me here? No. You want a BBM?
Officer LaFleur, tell us what you're doing now and why. Um, I looked over it and seen that they were getting the oxygen tank out. Um, noticed that they were using on a bag valve mask, which I was more appropriate for that situation than the one that goes around their face. Um, I'm just helping them, doing as much as I can to help. So g give us a little bit more information. Uh, what causes you to believe that the bag valve mask is more appropriate than the one that goes around your face? And when you say the one that goes around your face, what do you mean? Um, if the oxygen were to run out or they had to use manual um, breaths, they could use the bag. The other one is just something that's over their face. Okay. And what made you think that the bag valve mask was more appropriate? Um, nothing really. I just believe it's, it's, it's more, I don't know. Officer LaFleur, are you trained in life-saving measures? To an extent, yes. Okay. Was it anything about your training that caused you to think that that would be more appropriate? Uh, it's just what we've tra been trained with versus the one that uh, was already on her. Okay. Gabby, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you just make sure nobody else comes in. Yeah, we got here. Uh, yes, they're in that bag. Right there in the top. Purple. Nope, that's the top. Helena. Is, is anybody allowed to go with her in the helicopter? Yeah, no. Helena, deep breath. Deep breath, Helena. There you go. Deep breath. Deep breath, Helena. Deep breath. Be okay. Good girl. Good girl. There you go. Good girl. Deep breath. Jesus. 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 I don't know how to do it. Do you guys pack uh, it? Uh, no. What do you guys I need? A, uh, I just need another dog tag. Dog tag? Something for um, pressure. Uh, uh, I think a big one. This one? This one? No, no. Uh, no. Uh, the this one? Yeah. 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 You got a stretcher? Yeah. Uh, not me here, no. Okay. Let me help him get the stretcher. Stretcher. What are you doing now? Just trying to stay busy, help clear the way for the stretcher, the ambulance is here. Here's priority number one. Okay. Let's clear in all this stuff out of there. Get it right in here and get it out. All right. So we got air flight and route. Uh, not yeah. only here, we can get a few of them. Helena? Helena? Okay. This is Helena Huffington. What's that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go Okay, okay. So, I got the air. Okay, uh, thank you. Get all that up. I'm not going to have you go. All right, see you. We're going to need to get the going. Officer LaFleur, have additional first responders now arrived? Yes. Uh, can, can you give us an idea of who's on set assisting now? So it looks like more paramedics have arrived and Lieutenant Benavides is right there. Okay, the, and, and do you mean this gentleman here? Yes, ma'am. That my cursor's on? And, and who was Lieutenant Benavides? Um, he was our day shift lieutenant at the time. Was he a supervisor? Yes, ma'am. We got it through and through on her. We went through and through on her, through the chest, and then you got one in the arm over there. Everybody stop what they're doing right now.
This is a fresh scene. Okay, everyone's okay. Whose voice is that that we're hearing? Lieutenant Benavides. Hutchins is being taken now. Um, into the back of the ambulance. And can you explain why is she going into the back of an ambulance rather than the helicopter? The helicopter hasn't arrived yet. And my understanding is that they have additional medicines and um, equipment and measures they can take inside of an ambulance. All right, thank you. <laughs> Disconnect here. You got it? Hey, sit, sit, sit over there. You guys want to see Vincent? 32 sound. Hey, what's ETA on the bird? What did you just say? I asked the ETA in the helicopter. And who are you speaking to? Uh, Santa Fe Dispatch. Do you recall how they responded? It's been a minute since I watched this video, so. All right. Oh, we got the bird right here. the helicopter now arriving? Yes, ma'am. Well, what are you doing now? Um, appears I'm grabbing crime scene tape. Well, why are you grabbing crime scene tape? Um, to start the crime scene. I don't know if anybody had told me to grab the tape yet, but I knew we needed to start one. You felt that you needed to put up crime scene crime scene tape. Yes, ma'am. Or somebody may have asked for it. What's that? I'm sorry. Uh, or somebody may have, somebody may have asked asked me for it. I'm just not too sure. Okay. And what's crime scene tape used for? To mark the perimeter or the inner perimeter of essentially what a crime scene, which they want to tape off and only allow certain people in and out. Okay. And was that an issue in this scene? The crime scene? Well, cordoning off the crime scene, was that an issue here? Yeah, it's, it's, it was a, a unique situation because of the, uh, you can't really tie crime scene tape to nothing. So we had, I think at one point they actually used our patrol units as to tie the tape around and go to the next one. And why is it important to cordon that off? Um, just for evident, evidential purposes, um, allow only certain people in and out. Because at this point, we didn't know what was going on. So, and were there uh, people in that area that were not first responders? Yes. Approximately, how many, if you recall? I don't know. I couldn't give you a number. Really, there was just a lot of people on the outside um, that I hadn't seen originally inside the church. So. Okay, and did you know who those people were? No. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
this person here in the gray shirt? Yes, ma'am. Was that a first responder? No. So when the crime scene tape goes up, what happens to that person? Uh, I can't recall. Well, I haven't watched the video yet. Hypothetically, is that person allowed to stay inside the crime scene? No. Okay. Who are the people that are allowed to stay inside the tape? Um, medical and law for first responders. This is in the middle of a shot, and I have live ordinance on the ceiling up there. It's safe, okay, but it is here, right above here, okay, right there. That's okay. And if you get to the point where you say you want me to move, all right, I'll hold my guys, okay. Where's the, where's the bird? It's right here. Okay. Yeah, what are you doing now? Um, I talked with the paramedics inside the ambulance, and they asked me where the helicopter was. I told him I was landing, and he asked them to bring the, the paramedics to them. So you're bringing the paramedic from the helicopter to the ambulance? Yes. All right. We got a, uh, approximately 23 year old female in the back of the ambulance right now. Gunshot underneath the right arm, went through all the way to the back left. Can you carry this back for you, sir? I got it. You got it? This was priority. Have you guys just step over there for us, okay? Can I have you guys get over there for us? We're going to have to gather everybody up, get everybody's names, everybody who's on scene, okay? What are you doing now? Um, just trying to think what's next. Um, I think I'm putting the pilot, one of the pilots' um, head headgear inside the ambulance on the other side of the door. Why are you telling those people to move? Um, just to start to gather people up because they're just standing around the, uh, the church where the said incident happened. Why didn't you do that when you initially got there? Um, just went, went in and um, made sure that medical, uh, that people were receiving medical treatment and then slowly go with the go with the flow. See what what it could do next. It is. Are, are you trained to take action to save lives before moving witnesses around? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 
Let's go, sir. I believe you guys will be taking this one. Did she go in the bird? No, not yet. They're, 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 they did an IV, did an IO, and then they're going to take in the bird. They're coming out, watch yourself. They're moving it from this one. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of them still. And who's Jack is that? Joel. Joel? Okay. It's got his phone. Hey, careful, it is bloody. Okay. It's got his phone, it's got his other stuff in it. Okay, well, we're going to just keep it here. So, he was his phone? Officer LaFleur, uh, this woman who, who's speaking right now, she's not a police officer, right? No. Um, was she employed with the uh, fire department? No, she was their set medic, I'm guessing. When you say set medic, do you mean she's the medic on the movie set? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, he was wearing it. Why? Where's his phone at? Uh, I don't know. Do you have any idea why movie sets would have medic, me medical personnel on scene? Um, it's probably for safety reasons. Someone closer than the paramedics or fire department. For safety reasons? Yeah. Phone. Anybody have Joel? Yeah. All right, gentlemen. Um, I just need your IDs, and then have you guys step outside and wait for the investigators to get here. Okay? Cool. Cool. Yes. Any idea who these guys are? Just more. Uh, People involved with the movie set. Movie set employees. Yeah. Is that your impression? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And who's the props guy? She, who's in charge of props? She has green and purple hair. You can't miss her. Okay. I was on. I was here when it happened. You were here when it happened. Who else was here when it happened? Uh, my uh, uh, the camera operator. How many people you think were in here when it happened? Uh, three, maybe four. Four? Maybe. Okay. So two more other than you two? Reed, as soon as I see him. He Reed, was camera operator. Reed, yes, sir. Okay, who else? Reed Russell was here. Uh, Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin was the actor on set that pulled the trigger. Alec Baldwin? Yes, sir. How about you there? Where's he at? We got one. Yeah, you help me find him? Yes, Okay. How's it going, sir? Um, so, I, my understanding, um, you, were, you were in the room when the lady when I someone was shot. The gun, yeah. Okay. All righty. Um, well, I, I know your name, so it, it's it's uh, um, Jenny. Pursuant to the uh, stipulation, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, jump ahead. I want to make sure this is the right part. Okay. Let me give up my lieutenant and see, see where, we want right. you to, where we want you to hang out, okay? Uh, whatever you want to do. Yes, sir. All right. Give me just a second. LT. So I got. So apparently I was not given the appropriate reaction. You want me to jump in five seconds now? What? I need to know what to do, or I just press play. What, what do I do? Do you want to pull the trigger? Do you want me to have him sit tight or? Yeah, he's gonna have to sit tight. Sit tight and you. I have the armor in here. This is all their stuff. I have the the gun used is in there. And I got the two people that were in the room. Okay. You want me to have Alec Baldwin take a seat in the back one unit or? Um, no, I, we know where he's at. We know where he is. Yeah. We just need to see. Is he in a trailer? No, he's right there, in the gray and black. 
Okay. Ooh. All right. So try to keep him away from everybody. Okay. Not going to talk to anybody. Okay. I can just have him sit. I can sit with him in my unit. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Officer LaFleur, at this point in time, what's your intention? I was going to go back to where uh, Mr. Baldwin was and then escort him to my unit. When I got there, I realized my unit is over here being used as a post for the crime scene. So what did you do when you realized that? Um, just had him sit where he was and had everybody just hang out there, started writing down people's names. Okay. Um, What are these people doing? Seems like they're talking about what happened. Now, as a law enforcement officer, is that something that concerns you? Uh, yes. And why? why? Why does that concern you? Um, they could be, um, one person could be telling them what they saw and I mess up what they have to say what they saw. So it could essentially um, um, coerce testimony, I guess. People would say the same thing because the other person said it rather okay. than saying their own, their own opinion, their own view of what they saw. Okay. Mr. Baldwin, um, who's the director on scene? The guy that was shot. The, the guy that was shot? He's in okay. Where is um, he now? Do you guys have a, a production car? Or? There's an AD. Okay. I'm happy to stay right here and do everything. Well, uh, my, my Lieutenant, I just want you to, to stay away from everybody and not to talk to nobody. So um, I, I was, wait right here. You, we can wait right here and have everybody step back, or we can wait in the back on patrolling, but I prefer to not put you there, okay? You want water or something now? want to find props to get a cigarette. So. Why did you let Mr. Baldwin sit there instead of putting him in some vehicle and separating him from the other witnesses? Um, like I said, my unit was clear across being used as a uh, post. And just because I didn't know what we had right there, came to maintain cooperation with people involved. Well, it sounds like you gave him an option. You let him choose. Is that right? Um, yeah, he wanted to stay right there and figured if I could keep him there, um, I didn't see a big problem with it until uh, later on when people were talking and whatnot. And did, did you give uh, Mr. Baldwin instructions about whether or not he could speak to people? I did tell him to stop talking. Um, and did you give instructions to the other witnesses that were around? Um, I didn't tell, tell them, um, but I told them that he had to sit there and um, not talk to nobody. Okay. I got a big one. What do you got? You got medium? Armor? We'll take it. Sure, you got one of the Hands are shaking. Try to come. Yes, sir. Right, I'm right there. The silver car is Alex's vehicle. If you want to spin him in there. Wait, Mr. Baldwin, is that your car? Yeah. We can wait in there. We can wait in your car if you if you want to. Just look at the car. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, we can wait. Hang out right here then. Is Joe gone? They both gone? Yeah. Uh, well, they're still working on the female. Uh, if you, you haven't seen the helicopter take off, then they're not gone yet. If you know Officer Lafleur, why hadn't the helicopter taken off yet? I don't know exactly why, but. My guess is they have to stabilize the patient before they can put them in, in the air. In the air, okay.
Why are you just standing there? Just standing with Mr. Baldwin, allowing him to smoke a cigarette, making and, and sure. And why is it important for you to be standing there? Um, essentially, he's detained, not free to leave. Um, so I'm there with him. two gentlemen uh, standing over there that we can see what what is there something important about them um, the guy in the gray was I had him stand over there because he was inside the room when I had first got at the uh, the church and um, the other guy in the brown uh, apparently was in the in the church too so I just want everybody who was in the church in one area so we could be easily be found so you wanted everyone that was in the church in one area. Yes, ma'am. And are we looking at that area? Um, to the left of Baldwin is where the majority of everybody was, yes. Okay. And those were the witnesses that were in the church? From what I was told, yes. Okay. So, Mr. Baldwin, um, how many people were in the room when it happened? I don't know. It's a crew. 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 It's a Six or seven, I need a uh, definite answer. Sure. I don't know. Okay. So I got one here, the two that were injured, that makes three, and then these two gentlemen, four or five. Um, so who, who would be the other two? Yeah, it's that wrong. Um, more than six? Okay. Were you in the room? I was at the door, right? You at the door? Can I get your ID? Do you know whether or not the person in the jean shirt was a what was inside the church and witnessed the incident? Uh, I do not know. Okay, why don't you come on over to the back of the uh, Three two to two four. I have uh, three eighty for the first time. Well, he was inside. Does it appear to you that Mr. Baldwin is speaking to the other witnesses? Um, I think he was talking about who was. Who would have the, who would know who's in the room? Okay. I can't really hear it. Um, and then the, apparently the guy's son was working there as well. Okay. Um, is this an ideal way to separate someone from witnesses? After looking at it, probably not, but this is what happened. Okay. Understood. You arrived at the door? Do you have an idea on you, sir? Thank you. 
Uh, as of right now, she, her, 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 her status is questionable. That's why we called the air, air light. But where were you at, sir? I was right behind him. Right behind him? Okay. Yeah, I was right behind him right when that happened. All right. So just have you guys hang out for me right here. Um, we'll get someone to get your statement in just a second, okay? And then we cleared, they cleared the gun outside after yeah, his request, and I witnessed them clear it and saw the bullets. Okay. So the only one was yeah, they were all the one that was missing, the one that fired, we don't know, but all the other ones were proper. Um, they had loads. Officer Lafleur, uh, does it seem to you right now that they're talking about the incident? Seems like they're talking about the gun that was used in the incident. Okay. They were, yeah, they were loaded. Officer, do you know what this conversation is about that we're watching right here? Something about a shake test. I don't know. Maybe um, the rounds, dummy rounds, maybe. Okay. I'm not too entirely sure. Do you agree with me that, well, was Mr. Baldwin supposed to be talking about the incident? <coughs> no, ma'am. Does he appear to be doing it anyway? Yes, ma'am. talking about the incident? Yes, ma'am. Is there a reason that you didn't stop them since you told them not to? I think uh, as time goes on, I tell them to stop. Okay. Yes. You're in the room? Okay. Can you see, get your ID, sir? That's what I said. I think there was more than six or seven guys. I think it was about eight. You see this gentleman over here on the left? Yes, ma'am. Any reason to believe he was inside the room at the time? Yeah, I'm not sure at this point. Okay. Yeah. Were you in the room too, ma'am? So she basically they're they're trying to stabilize her vital signs enough for the, the flight sure. and administer any kind of nar uh, narcotics or anything they need. Blood thinners if that may be, then they'll load her up in the in the helicopter and they'll fly her there. I believe the other ambulance is on the other side, um, and he seems to be doing better than she was. So Absolutely. they might drive him in an ambulance. I heard him wave off the other bed. So. Where did they get them? Do you want to ask me to get them? It was a little bit of a good answer. Yeah. 
Story St. Vincent's. They're both trauma ones. Thanks for the information. I was curious. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no problem. Officer LaFleur, have more first responders now arrived? Um, off, to your, off to your right, you can see. There it is. Off to your right, you can see uh, more patrol units showing up. Um, this deputy showed up, but uh, this corporal had been there for a minute. And approximately how long have you now been on scene? Um, according to my body cam, a little over 25 minutes. Okay. Hey, Corporal. I got uh, seven people there in the room when it happened, all their IDs, so. Okay. Um, Get it all brought that down. I'm not sure what the ID can offer us. It's okay. At that point in time, what was your understanding of how many people were in the room and witnessed it? Uh, I believe I said seven. Okay. Do you know whether or not that turned out to be true? Um, I think there was actually more. I wrote all the people who said that where they were in the room uh, in my report. Okay. Hey, sir. Okay. Um, and I'm just hanging out with him because yeah, and he's the one who pulled the trigger. So. Okay. Yeah, he he told you. Sorry, I didn't. I was I set things up a while ago. And... You got a notepad, Freddie? All right. Do you have a notepad? Officer LaFleur, at this point in time, I, I know he's no longer in the frame, but the gentleman in the in the blue denim shirt, do you know whether or not he was in the room at the time? Um, I don't re recall if he was in the room or not. Okay. I know there was some director or whatnot there. Okay. Yeah, I don't have my unit. Yeah. Oh, start. Yeah, I know. It came off when I was... Given uh, trying to pack the wounds. Yeah. Okay. Officer LaFleur, does it look like Mr. Baldwin is speaking to a potential witness? He just looks like he's talking to the guy who says his name is the, one of the directors, yes. Okay. Um, is that what you had in mind when you asked Mr. Baldwin not to speak to anyone? No. Do you know what they're talking about? I couldn't hear what they were talking about. I did hear him ask him what cigarettes he was smoking and if he could have one.
Oh, geez. Hi. Or do you want to just try some things on? No, because I'm going to be writing quite a bit. Everybody's in the room. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I have my phone on me. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll write down. Do you see the gentleman in the denim shirt gesturing? You want me to back it up? Yeah, which one? Are we talking about this gentleman? Yeah. Do you, do you know what he's gesturing? No, it looks like he picks up his hand. <laughs> now that you... Now that you play it back, it looks like he's shaking his hand. And had you seen him do that previously? No, not until just now. I thought you testified earlier about a shake test. The, the gentleman was talking about a shake test. Okay. But I have not seen the director do it until reviewing the footage now. Okay. <clears throat> My eyes aren't always exactly where the body cam's pointed. So. Absolutely. Um, when you tell people not to talk about the incident, do you have an expectation that they'll follow your instructions? Yes, ma'am. Does it look like they're following your instructions? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, Officer LaFleur, I'm going to stop the video there. Uh, what, what else did you do on scene that day? Um, I helped. Um, since they just wait with uh, other witnesses, I guess, or people that wanted to give a statement or they needed a statement from at a different location. It was their base camp is what they called it. So you needed to take statements from people that were at another location? Is that what you said? No, we took people from where is essentially where we had them, and they took them down to their base camp, um, and that's where they started interviews. And the, the people that you take to base camp, are those the same people that we see here in the video? I believe so. Those people and um, I don't know how many people they ended up interviewing. Um, did, uh, did at any point in time, did Mr. Baldwin tell you that he didn't pull the trigger of the gun? I believe he told me he was holding a gun. Um, I believe in the beginning when I was leaving the church, one of the guys said that Baldwin had pulled the trigger. Um, so just off of what was told. And I know that this sounds ridiculous, but we have to follow some jurisdictional rules. Do you see Mr. Baldwin in this uh, frame here? Yes, ma'am. Would you point him out, please? And do you see that same gentleman in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. And would you point him out, please? Uh, he's sitting in the, in the middle with the um, glasses. Okay. Anything else that you did um, of import that you can think of that you think the jury should hear about? I think that's about it. How long were you on scene, if you recall? Um, from when I got there, it was... I don't know, about 10 hours maybe or so. I was there until dark. You were there for 10 hours? Yeah, until they were done interviewing people. Is that typical? Um, it is if that's what they need to be done, so. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, just for the record, uh, we would ask that the record reflect that uh, uh, Officer LaFleur has identified the defendant. Yes. Thank you. I'll pass the witness.
May I proceed? Sorry, Mr. Spider. Oh, sorry. Get that out of your way. Always find the recording of something. May I proceed? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, when you got to the scene, Mr. Baldwin um, walked up to you and said, I, I was holding a gun. He blurted it out, right? Yes. And in fact, you, you, he was very shocked, very, if you could picture Alec Baldwin in a pale state, you know, very unsure of himself. You could say an actor out of character. Fair? Sure. Object to the formal question. I, it, it, it is Mr. Spiro testifying in the no, question. No, okay. May we approach? When you saw Mr. Baldwin, he looked very shocked. If you could picture Mr. Baldwin in a pale state, you know, like unsure of himself, you could say an actor out of character. Is that a fair description? Sure. And he said to you, I'm here, whatever you want to do, right? Yes. He said to you at one point, where should I go, right? Yes. And he also pointed out to you who the director was on scene who was hitting the shoulder, right? I believe so. He asked and inquired about him. And he also asked you how she was doing, right? Meaning Miss Hutchins, right? Yes. I don't remember you being asked about that indirect, were you? And you mean asked by that by the state? Yeah. Objection relevance? Overruled. So I want to take a step back. The dispatch that came over to your radio, sir, before you got to the scene was a dispatch for an accidental shooting by a prop gun, correct? I believe that's what was told to me, yes. Okay. And you've testified to that previously, right? Yes. Okay. And the dispatch um, report, you know, you know that you re received that, that wording, accidental discharge, several times, right? I believe so. Okay. So I want to ask you, I want to ask you, how come when you described it today in court, how come you didn't include the word accident when you testified before this jury? I'm not one to say if it was an accident or not. Just there to initially respond to it, and then the detectives determine out whether or not it was an accident. Well, sure, but every other time you've been asked about this, you've said it was an accident. And now today at the trial of Alec Baldwin, when you're talking to this jury, you left that word out. Isn't that true? Not intentionally, no. Did you meet with the prosecutors before you testified here today? Just briefly in, in the room outside for them to tell me who, who was in order of what witness. You've discussed your testimony previously with Ms. Morrissey, correct, before today? Um, just in a pre-trial interview, yes. We've talked about your lapel that was on. It's true, right, that the lapel is actually mandatory. Yes. Right? And so they came to the officers, passed the law, and told you you had to wear your lapel, right? Yes. And the way it works is it, proceed, it, it secures all of these statements, and when you're done wearing it for the day, you go back to the station, you log it in, and, there's, and then it exists, right? Essentially, yeah, but it, it's more complex than that. It uploads on itself. Oh, it self-uploads so that it maintains itself? Yes. And we then you then talked a little bit about um, the security of the scene, um, and you talked about crime scene tape going up, right? Yes. But it, as you just told this jury, you know, at the time you don't know whether this is an accident or not, right? Yes. It's not like a crime scene tape is it, some evidence of a crime, right? And whether it was an accident or a crime, the crime scene is still essential. And you've been very candid that you've you made some mistakes at the scene, right? Yes. And that you've learned since then about some of these mistakes, right? Yes. You've said hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Yes. And you know, you can Monday morning quarterback decisions, but you made them in the field, right? Yes. Okay. And you've said that based on your training and experience, you know that if witnesses are left to speak to each other, they can taint each other's memories, right? Yes. And sometimes that's incidental and accidental, right? Yes. And sometimes it's purposeful. 
right? Depends on who's there, yes. Well, if you were with somebody and somebody was talking to you about the 911 call, right? And they kept saying to you over and over, it wasn't an accident, it wasn't an accident. And then you testify and you leave out the word accident. That could be an example of pain, couldn't it? Sure. And also non-witnesses contain people's memories too. You agree with me? I guess. Well, you know, at one point in your testimony previously, you had said that there was a lawyer on the scene that was talking to some of the people that were on the scene. I believe so, yeah. Okay. Um, and if that lawyer told somebody on the scene, I think your understanding is that could have tainted their, their view of the memory, right? Essentially, yes. Mr. Baldwin never asked to speak to that lawyer, did he? I'm not to my recollection. And, you know, then you went on and you said, you know, it, that you had told Mr. Baldwin not to speak to the other witnesses. Do you remember that testimony? Yes. And I think you were asked approximately five times why Mr. Baldwin was disobeying your orders. Do you remember that testimony? Yes. Yeah. But in the lapel video that we just saw, you're not going up to Mr. Baldwin and, or these witnesses going, get, get out of here. Get out of here. I'm an officer. you got to separate. You don't do that, right? Nope. And also in that video, you can see a lot of these people are coming over to Mr. Baldwin, right? Yes. One of them comes over and shakes his hand, right? Yes. Have you ever seen that in all of your experience? Somebody commit a homicide and everybody and all the witnesses are on the scene, circling around the person, shaking his hand and talking about what happened. Have you ever seen that in your entire career? No. And then you went on to say, well, you didn't put him in the cruiser. You didn't put him in the cruiser um, because your cruiser was being used. It was, was, I guess, the reason that you gave. Was that, did I understand that right? My patrol unit was being actively used as a post on the other side of the field for when, crime scene. When you say a post, you mean like it, it goes somewhere else and you put the tape around it? Is that? The side mirror was wrapped around with crime scene tape. Uh-huh. You mean there were also another dozen officers on the scene that, that day that had police cars that they wanted to put Mr. Baldwin in at any point, right? Yep. Okay. And um, in fact, Mr. Baldwin later on drives himself to the precinct and goes and speaks to the police, right? I'm not too sure how he got there, but he did get there. Well, he wasn't under arrest, right? Not to my knowledge, no. And so you use this word detained. When, when Ms. Morrissey asked you, well, Ms., were you detaining Mr. Baldwin? Do you remember that question? Yes. Isn't it true that even today, Years later, no police officer has ever represent, rep, arrested Mr. Baldwin or detained him in a police car. True? I don't know. The police department, the Santa Fe Police Department, has never arrested Mr. Baldwin. Not the Back Santa Fe Police Department. Back to the question, asked and answered. And one of the things that you do as an officer on the scene is you observe demeanor, right? Yes. And you spent 10 hours on the scene, I think I heard you say, right? Yes. You got to see the people of Rust that day live, right? Yes. And the truth of the matter is <clears throat> that you took it as a way how everybody was acting and that the individual who claimed to have been holding the firearm was still there, that there was no... The way he was, his demeanor was that there was there wasn't any intention behind the act, as you could say. Isn't that true? I wouldn't say there was no intention. I don't know the individual's intentions, but his demeanor was sad, um, upset. Okay, well, it's not just his demeanor being sad and upset, right? Okay, we'll move that to the side. And I understand you're not a mind reader, right? Correct? Yes. Okay. All you can do is look at the people and look at how they're interacting and make your own judgments, right? Yes. Okay, and you do that as a police officer to try to figure out how to interact with the scene. True? Yes. Okay, and 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 isn't it true <clears throat> that the way you took it, how everybody was acting and that the individual who claimed to have been holding the firearm was still there, that there was no, the way he was, his demeanor was that there wasn't any intention behind the act as you could say. Isn't that true? Again, the wording you're using, I wouldn't say okay. I had any clue of whose intention was what, but he was sad and upset. Okay, well, let's play. 
I'm going to play his statement to that effect. Can you view that up, please? That's okay with the court. He's saying he, he, did, he, he didn't say that he did. I'm going to impeach him. Well, you want me to clarify that? Yeah. Okay. Are you claiming that you didn't say that? Re rephrase what you said? Sure. Dispatch said it was an accidental shooting by a prop gun. So I, I didn't know if there was any. I took it as the way how everybody was acting and that the individual who claimed to have been holding the firearm was still there, that there was no, the way he was, his demeanor was that there was, wasn't any intention behind the, the act, as you could say, you know. Again, I wouldn't say I knew what his intention was. I understand that. What I'm asking you now, okay, is did you in fact say those words that I just asked you? At what time, the Gutierrez or PTI? Yes. I may have. Okay. You don't deny saying that. No. One more time. I'm just going to ask you, did you say that statement that I read? If you're reading the statement and it says my name next to it, then I'm going to likely say it. I just don't recall when. And one of the other things um, that happened that day that, that I don't think we've talked about is um, you, you, you spoke to a witness who told you that um, a woman named Sarah was crying and shaking and going through the bullets and saying, I don't know how it got in there. Objection hearsay. I'm asking the, the witness if, if he had that information. He's, but he's making the statement, the hearsay statement is coming in. Do, do, do you know whether anybody at the scene was, um, before you got there, um, shaking and going through the bullets and saying, I don't know how it got in there? I don't know. Okay. If we could refresh the witness with his help, um, and I would ask that we just, can I put it up on just his screen? Sure. Okay. I don't think you can do that. I would object because that's not proper refreshment. We don't refresh in front of the jurors. That's my objection. What, what do you mean? Well, if we're refreshing... Okay. You know, we're going to take a lunch break real quick, and we're going to be back at 1 o'clock, okay? Please don't talk among yourselves. I'm going to ask you to I will rise to the jury. All right. All right, you're excused. You can move over. And this thing is a battery and council approach. Followed by two hired hitmen 
who traveled all the way from Miami to Tallahassee for the sole purpose of murdering him. And just like something out of a horror movie, he pulls in his driveway in the car Moments later, Dan Martell's neighbor shot. He looked out the window and he saw a light colored Prius backing quickly out of Dan Martell's driveway and then speeding away. The neighbor waited for a couple minutes to see if maybe Dan Martell came out of his house or backed out of his driveway too. And when nothing happened, this neighbor got that funny feeling that maybe something could be wrong here. So he walked over and what he found was a gruesome scene. He walked in the garage and saw that the driver's side window of Dan Markell's car was shattered. He saw Dan Markell was still behind the wheel. Uh, with, he was alive, but he was moaning. He was unresponsive and he was terribly injured. The neighbor then goes and calls 911. Law enforcement arrives and they find Dan Markell unresponsive with um, gunshot wounds to his head. He was then taken to the hospital where he survived for uh, several hours before he was actually pronounced dead. Dan Markell was 41 years old and the, his little boys that were deprived of their father that day were just three and four years old. Law enforcement immediately began to investigate, to figure out who shot Dan Markell. And the evidence they find sets them down two separate paths. One path is that they had to track down that light colored Prius that the neighbor saw fleeing from the crime scene and identify who was inside that Prius. And the other path relates to Dan Markell's personal life. They looked to see who, if anybody, in Dan Markell's personal life would hate Dan Markell enough to kill him. And after years of tireless investigation by law enforcement, both of these two paths led directly to this defendant. So let's talk about the path involving Dan Markell's personal life first. In looking at who might have a motive to kill Dan Markell, law enforcement learned that Markell was entangled in a very nasty divorce with his ex-wife, who is the defendant's sister. And her name is Wendy Adelson. A review of their divorce case file revealed that Wendy Adelson asked the court to allow her to move back to Miami where she was from with the kids in order to be near her parents, whose names are Harvey and Donna Adelson, and her brother, the defendant. Dan Markell was adamantly opposed to his children being relocated to Miami. He was a law professor here in Tallahassee. This is where he lived. This is where his kids have been raised. He wanted his kids to live here with him. And for this custody dispute, the judge ended up ruling in Dan Martell's favor. So Wendy Adelson was not permitted to move to Miami with the children. Unless, of course, something happened to Dan Martell. A review of Wendy Adelson's emails revealed that her mother, Donna Adelson, hated Dan Martell and was desperate to find a way for Wendy and her children, who were Donna Adelson's grandchildren, to be able to move to Miami. Donna Adelson suggests in these emails that y'all will hear about several ways that Wendy Adelson could threaten or bully Dan Markell into submission, into getting what uh, she wanted him to do. Donna Adelson even suggested offering Dan Markell a $1 million bribe to allow the relocation, and even said that this defendant, Charlie Adelson, would pay a third of that million dollar bribe to Dan Markell to make that happen. 
The evidence in this case will show that Donna Adelson's closest confidant was her son, the defendant. She and the defendant talked multiple times a day, every day. He was the person with whom she would constantly vent and complain to about Wendy's situation. The defendant was also the person that Donna Adelson relied on to solve her problems. And this was a big, big problem for Donna Adelson. And she made it the defendant's problem to solve. So the divorce between Wendy Adelson and Dan Markell was final about a year before the actual murder. But that was not the end of that case. Litigation was ongoing, to say the least. Each side would continue to routinely file violations of the custody agreement, violations of the settlement agreement, and that continued right up until Dan Markell's death in July of 2014. This was a highly emotionally charged situation between them leading up to his death. Um, however, there was no physical violence that Wendy Adelson needed to be rescued from or anything like that. But make no mistake, this was a very messy custody dispute. Shortly before the murder, in fact, Dan Markell, the victim, filed with the court um, and basically asked the court, he alleged that Donna Adelson was disparaging him to his children by saying bad things about him. And he asked the court to enter an order preventing Donna Adelson from having unsupervised contact with her grandchildren. This motion was still pending in court when Dan Markell was killed. The murder of Dan Markell ensured that an adverse ruling on his motion would never be a problem for the Adelsons. And just about 48 hours after the shooting, Wendy Adelson and the little boys relocated to Miami. Shortly thereafter, moved into a home within walking distance of the Adelsons' Miami home. Within a year of Dan Markell's murder, Wendy Adelson legally changed Dan Markell's son's last name from Markell to Adelson. And just like that, their father was just effectively erased from their lives at three and four. And the Adelson's family, their big problem had been solved. You'll hear during this trial that the Adelson's are a very tight-knit family. The defendant and his parents, Harvey and Donna Adelson, they actually even all work together or worked together at the Adelson Institute, which was their family's dental practice. At the Adelson Institute, the defendant and Harvey Adelson were dentists and Donna Adelson managed the office. After Dan Markell was killed on July 18, 2014, law enforcement interviewed Wendy Adelson and Wendy Adelson acknowledged that her family had a motive to kill Dan Markell or to want him dead. She admitted that her brother, the defendant, had even said that he looked into hiring a hitman to kill Dan Markell as a divorce present to her, but he decided to buy her a TV instead because it was cheaper. And coincidentally, or not, that TV that this defendant bought his sister as a divorce gift instead, instead of hiring a hitman would be Wendy Adelson's alibi for the morning of the murder when the defendant, or when the victim was killed by a hitman. So this path of looking into Dan Martell's life to see who would have a motive to want him dead leads law enforcement to the Adelsons, including this defendant, a man who told his family that he'd looked into hiring a hitman to kill Dan Markell. The defense asked yesterday in jury selection, you know, who's talked trash or heard somebody talk trash about an in-law, which is not 
a rare concept. A lot of people don't like their in-laws. But the difference here is that the defendant's comment Stop being just a little bit of trash talk when Dan Markell was actually killed by a hitman. While the police are trying to investigate, you know, who in Dan Markell's personal life may have a motive to kill him, they're simultaneously going down that second path I described to y'all, which was tracking down the vehicle that the neighbor saw fleeing the crime scene. When law enforcement retraced Dan Markell's steps the morning of the murder, they uncovered some chilling surveillance video of a Prius fitting the description of the one seen by the neighbor following Dan Markell into the premier gym parking lot, waiting for an hour while he was inside, and then following him home from premier gym back to his neighborhood. They got this, these surveillance images from city buses, from Premier, from everywhere they possibly could. And these surveillance images, coupled with a massive amount of phone data and sun pass records gathered in this case, helped police to eventually track down the exact car used in this crime. But police still had to figure out who was in the Prius and why did they kill Dan Markell. As part of this really painstaking review that law enforcement did of, of all of these records, and when I say painstaking, finding this Prius and finding this, these, all of this evidence and all of these records was not an easy task, and it took longer than your average investigation. It was very difficult to do. They combed through tons of phone records and even did um, what's called a tower dump which is where law enforcement collected a list of all of the cell phone numbers that communicated with the cell tower that serviced different spots in Tallahassee that Dan Markell was at that morning, including Premier Jim, when the suspect's Prius were there. Because they thought if the person in the Prius was using their phone at the time, then their number will be somewhere in this tower dump. They combed through all of that data and they found a number with a Miami area code belonging to a man named Sigfredo Garcia. Law enforcement examined all of Garcia's call logs and saw that he was in frequent contact with another number that was also present at Premier Gym that morning. And that number belonged to a man named Luis Rivera. Luis Rivera is a lifelong friend of Sigfredo Garcia and is also from Miami. Police then looked at all of Garcia and Rivera's phone records, which showed that their phones left Miami about two, or two days before this murder, on July 16th of 2014. The phones came to Tallahassee, and on the day of the murder, July 18th, they followed Markel to Premier Gym. The phone data is consistent with both men turning off their phones just minutes before the murder and leaving their phones off until about an hour or so after the murder when they're well on their way back towards Miami. And then a bank's ATM camera caught both Garcia and Rivera in that light-colored Prius once they arrived back in the Miami area when they stopped at an ATM. So, Police figured out the identity, and this should appear on the screens in front of you, the identity of the two men responsible for following and killing Dan Markell. Luis Rivera, his nickname is Tato, and Sigfredo Garcia, his nickname is Tudo. But they continued to look for evidence of why this why two seemingly random men came all the way to Tallahassee to kill a man, Dan Markell, that they'd never met. You know, what or who is the connection between these killers and the victim? 
Well, phone records reveal that one of Sigfredo Garcia's most frequent contacts was a woman named Catherine Magnanua. Her nickname is Katie. Garcia and Catherine Magbanwa have a long history of an on-again, off-again relationship over the course of many years, and they actually share two kids in common. And lo and behold, when looking at the phone records, Catherine Magbanwa is also one of the most frequent contacts of this defendant, Charlie Adelson. Law enforcement learned that at the time of Dan Markell's murder, this defendant was dating Catherine Maybanwa. She was his girlfriend at the time. So Dan Markell was a problem that this defendant needed to solve for his family. The defendant was looking to hire a hitman to kill Dan Markell. Dan Markell ends up being killed by a hitman and who ended up being the hitman? It was someone with a close relationship to this defendant's girlfriend. The hitman was the father of his girlfriend's children. So you can see how both leads in this case, followed by investigators. Both of them charted paths to this defendant. Not only did looking into the motive lead law enforcement to the defendant because he wanted to hire someone to kill, to, uh, kill Dan Markell, but looking into the car, fleeing the scene, also led law enforcement to the defendant through his girlfriend at the time. So two different investigations arriving at the same conclusion. <clears throat> law enforcement also tried to follow the money in this case. And that was a third way that the evidence in this case points to this defendant. Law enforcement reviewed bank records, employment records, DHSMV records of all of the suspects and saw that in the months after the homicide, Sigfredo Garcia, Luis Rivera, and Catherine McManawa all acquired some big ticket items. Rivera and Garcia both bought motorcycles and cars. Catherine Magbanwa got a breast augmentation surgery and later received a black Lexus sedan whose previous owner was Harvey Adelson. Catherine Magbanwa's bank records were analyzed and there was no check ever written or matching cash withdrawal for the car or the breast augmentation, which was paid for in cash. Bank record also review, bank records uh, also showed rather that Catherine Ray Banois' account had a huge spike in cash deposits right around the time of the murder. She deposited more money into her account in the five weeks following the murder than in the entire previous year before the murder. This was during a time when there was no record of her being employed anywhere. Also, about two months after the murder, the defendant added Catherine Magbanwa to the payroll at the Adelson Institute. And she began receiving regular checks from their business account every two weeks for two years after the murder. And this was despite the fact that she did not work at the Adelson Institute. So the money was talking, but what were the suspects saying? That's what law enforcement wanted to know. So as they're examining the phone records in this case, they see a distinct pattern surrounding important events and dates in this case. The phone calls and they can't see the content, they can't hear the content of these calls in these phone records, but they see that the calls are occurring. And the phone calls always went from Donna Adelson to the defendant, then from the defendant to Catherine Magbanwa, then from Catherine Magbanwa to Sigfredo Garcia, and back the other way, kind of like 
train cars, they only touch the car right in front of them. You know, Donna Adelson never calls Catherine McVanois or Sigfredo Garcia. Charlie Adelson never calls Sigfredo Garcia or vice versa. So if this is a murder for hire, as law enforcement suspects, could it be that the defendant was wisely insulating himself from the actual shooters by having Catherine McBanois act as a middleman between them? Law enforcement decided to launch an undercover investigation uh, designed to clarify who the members of the conspiracy were and how information traveled within this conspiracy. So police applied for and received court authorization to listen in real time to the phone calls of the defendant and Catherine McVanois. And this is what's known as a wiretap. By this point, the, the point that the uh, law enforcement received authorization to do this wiretap, it was April of 2016. So it's been not quite, but almost two years since the murder of Dan Markell, which occurred in July of 2014. So by April of 2016, the defendant and Catherine McBanawa are no longer dating at that point. They've been broken up since the fall of 2014. Catherine McBanawa is actually back together with Sigfredo Garcia, the father of her children at that point. Um, the defendant has moved on to many other brands since Catherine McBanawa, but the defendant and Catherine McBanawa are still in regular communication and have remained very close friends since the murder. And Rivera, who was the second hitman in that Prius, he, in April of 2016, was actually in federal prison doing time on, a, on another charge unrelated to this murder. So all of the members of this conspiracy have presumably gone on with their lives, believing they've gotten away with this murder. So even though law enforcement has authority to listen to their calls now, you know, what are they going what reason would these people have to still be discussing the murder at this point? So police needed to stage an event that would generate conversation between the conspirators about the murder. And the plan was to send an undercover agent posing as somebody on behalf of Luis Rivera, who was incarcerated, to walk up to Donna Adelson on the street and try to extort money out of her. And law enforcement refers to this uh, as the bump. So this undercover agent walks up to Donna Adelson one day as she's leaving the Adelson Institute during the day the undercover agent hands Donna Adelson a piece of paper. And on the piece of paper is an article about the murder of Dan Markell with his picture on it and, you know, FSU professor killed. Um, also on the piece of paper are a phone number and the amount of $5,000. The undercover agent tells Donna Adelson that he knows that the Adelsons are taking care of Katie and he's there to extort money out of her on Rivera's behalf in order to even things out. The undercover agent never says the defendant's name or anything about the defendant's involvement to Donna Adelson. Then law enforcement listens to see what will happen next. Will Donna Adelson go straight to the police to report this extortion attempt, or will something else entirely happen? As suspected, based on the previously observed communication pattern, the first person that Donna Adelson calls after the bump is the defendant. Despite the fact that the undercover agent never mentioned the defendant to her. On that first call, one would think that Donna Adelson would say to her son, you know, it's so crazy. Some man came up to me and he's handed me this article about Danny's murder and he's, he's you know, seems like he's demanding money from us. She never says any of that. In fact, 
she never says in Markel's name at all. Instead, she tells the defendant that she needs to talk to him in person, in person, not over the phone, about some paperwork that was hand delivered to her. She said that this paperwork, she says this to the defendant, it involves the two of us and that he should know what she's talking about. She says that he should bring cash to their meeting. And she also says that this TV is about five. Donna Adelson tells the defendant that the man who approached her mentioned an ex-girlfriend. Donna Adelson never says which ex-girlfriend she's referring to. She never says Catherine McManua or Katie's name to the defendant in that phone call. She only says that the blackmailer mentioned an ex-girlfriend. The defendant never asked his mom, whose ex-girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend, which ex-girlfriend? He never asked that. Because as the evidence will show, he didn't need to. He knew that this TV is about five, meant that she was being blackmailed about Danny's murder for 5,000. And he knew that the ex-girlfriend in question was Catherine McManua. And we know that because after this call with his mother, there's the defendant. The defendant calls Catherine Magbanua. He doesn't call his most recent ex-girlfriend. He doesn't even call the most recent ex-girlfriend before the most recent ex-girlfriend, the one before that. No, he calls Catherine Magbanua. And his call to Catherine Magbanua is the only call that he makes to any ex-girlfriend after getting the information from his mother that the blackmailer mentioned an ex-girlfriend. And he had not dated Catherine McBanwell for a year and a half at that point. And although the defendant threatens to do it often, <laughs> neither he nor his mom ever report the matter to the police. The only people that he discusses it with in these calls is Donna Adelson and Catherine McBanwell. And you'll hear these phone calls between the conspirators. And as you listen to these calls, y'all will notice that they are being cautious about what they say in, over the phone. It's very apparent that they are very careful with their words because they are immediately suspicious that law enforcement could be listening to their conversations. So Donna Adelson calls uh, the defendant and the defendant's first call is to Catherine McBanwa. After that, the defendant then meets up with his mom in person, like his mom requested. And his mom gives him this paperwork that the undercover agent gave her. Then next, the defendant and Catherine McBanwa meet up in person. And they meet up at a restaurant in Miami called Dolce Vita. And while they sat at their table, in this Dolce Vita is a busy, noisy restaurant. An undercover FBI agent sat at a table nearby with a hidden camera in their bag and recorded this conversation. And in the recording, we hear the defendant discussing whether the man who walked up to his mom could be an undercover police officer or someone who's trying to blackmail them. And if it's the latter, if it's a blackmailer, is it somebody who's just trying to make a quick buck? Or is it somebody who actually knows information from the inside? The defendant reassures Catherine McBanwa that if it is the police, that's a good thing. The defendant thinks that if it's the police, that means that they do not have enough evidence to charge anybody. In fact, the defendant tells her, if they had any evidence, we would have already gone to the airport. The defendant starts giving her some legal advice. He says that, hey, in order to prove that someone committed a crime, 
you have to be able to put the person at the scene of the crime at the time it was committed, which unfortunately for them is not an accurate statement of the law. It's important to note too, at the time of this conversation at Dolce Vita, no arrests had been made. The only thing that police had released to the public was a photo of the Prius that fled the scene. This, this was the Prius that Garcia and Rivera rented and used the day of Dan Markell's murder. So police knew at that point that it was Garcia and Rivera who were in the Prius, but the public did not know that yet and no arrests had been made because they wanted to do this undercover investigation. And so the fact that this photo of this Prius had been released to the public is interesting in light of some of the things that y'all will hear the defendant say to Catherine McBanwa in the Dolce Vita recording. He starts giving Catherine McBanwa several analogies, all involving rental cars used to commit crimes. He reassures her that Hey, if DNA is found in a car, all that means is that at one point, the person sat in a car. And if that car was later used in a crime, police can't prove that just from a person's DNA being in the car. The defendant points out to her that if a rental car is found that was at a crime scene, police also have to prove who was driving it at the time. He gives her a very relevant hypothetical of her renting a car in Miami and someone asking to borrow it and driving to Orlando to commit a robbery and how she would be innocent in that hypothetical because she wasn't in the car at the time of the robbery. So through these analogies, the defendant is reassuring Catherine McBanwa that even if police identify who rented the car that fled the scene, they still would not have enough evidence to hold anybody responsible for the murder, even if they did find out it was Garcia and Rivera. The defendant also says that crimes are tough to prove unless someone actually witnessed the suspect commit a crime, or a suspect makes a confession, or a suspect is caught on a wire talking about the crime. So the defendant's trying to reassure her about the lack of evidence. And hey, as long as we all stay quiet, then we don't have anything to worry about. At one point, the defendant said, asked her, let me ask you a question. And then he asked her about money. He says, when everybody was there the next day, did you take any money? Like, are any of you driving around in a Bentley? Or, I mean, or no, it's not like any of you are driving around in a Bentley or cruising around in a mega yacht. So here the defendant's pointing out that the money wasn't used to buy anything flashy that would draw the attention of the police. And when discussing, and you all will hear during the course of this trial why, why his statement or his question about the money from the next day is particularly important. The evidence will show that Catherine McBanwa went to the defendant's home the night of the murder where he paid her in cash. And the next day, Catherine McBanwa paid Garcia and Rivera their cuts of the money. When discussing the possibility of whether th this is actually some gangster trying to blackmail his family for money, the defendant says that whoever this person is, whoever it is, knows information. The defendant told Catherine McManua that there are two ways of dealing with this guy. They could call the police, but then the guy blackmailing them would be charged with trying to blackmail his family. And the blackmailer would start talking and he would start calling out Catherine McManua's name. And then police are gonna be asking questions about what happened. The other option is to pay the blackmailer, but let him know that this is a one-time thing and try to, try to scare the blackmailer off by saying, hey, if you come around again, we're going to the police. So the defendant then gives Catherine McBanwell very precise instructions. He wants her to call the blackmailer and tell him that, you know, this, is, this would be what he wants Catherine McBanwell to say, my friends, meaning the Adelson family, 
have no idea what you're talking about. And I don't have any idea what you're talking about either. But the name of the person who you said is incarcerated sounds familiar. So I'm going to give you this money as charity to help the less fortunate. But don't contact these people again or they're going to go to the police. And the defendant said he would give Catherine McDaniel the 5000 to pay off the blackmailer, except he's concerned, though, that this won't resolve the issue for good. The defendant is worried that this guy is not going to go away, that he's going to keep coming back for more and more money. And the defendant offers a solution to have this blackmailer killed. And he says he's willing to pay whatever it takes. The defendant tells her that, this is the defendant talking to Catherine McBanois, this guy, meaning the blackmailer, is effing with him and his wife. And you better kill him or he's going to be a big problem because he knows who you are. And the defendant then says, if he can't handle this, I'll have somebody else do it. The defendant says, so help me God, if they fuck with my family, it's going to be Nazi shit because this will be done. I mean, Katie, I don't care what I spend. It's important to note during this conversation and the entire wiretap, the defendant never says Sigfredo Garcia's name. But the evidence will show that the defendant was talking about Sigfredo Garcia when the defendant says that the blackmailer was effing with him and his wife. And if, hey, if he can't do it, I'll find someone else who will. Because immediately after that, the defendant checks with Catherine McVanua to make sure that Garcia has no hard feelings towards him, no reason not to help him. He says, hey, I have you on salary. You think he'd be happy about that? And he also says, I mean, our paths never crossed, meaning, hey, Garcia wasn't in the picture when he and Catherine and Van were together. There wasn't any overlap. After hearing that the defendant wants someone killed and is willing to pay whatever it takes to get it done, Catherine Van Manuel then asked the defendant to help her out. And the defendant reassures her that she'll be taken care of by saying, he says, I don't have to... <laughs> Sometimes those chairs can be a little wobbly. I know this is taking a bit, but I'm almost done. Thank y'all for being patient. All right, so she asked him to help her out. And the defendant reassures her that she'll be taken care of. He says he doesn't have to tell her the things that he'll do for her. He shows her what he'll do for her. She doesn't have to ask him for anything. He looks for things to do. He says, hey, when someone's birthday's coming up or there's car problems, she doesn't have to ask. He looks for ways to help. And after his meeting with Catherine Magnanua, the defendant immediately calls Donna Adelson to let her know that everything's fine. And he does this using some pretty obvious code words, which y'all will hear. And you will hear the conspirators often use words to mask the meaning of what they're actually talking about. Catherine Magbanwa then also using these code words tasks G Garcia with calling the number on the paperwork and finding out if a blackmailer is a legitimate associate of Rivera or not. And in the series of recorded calls that follow, you guys are going to hear these conspirators talking and using words like TV false leads, listings, properties, clients, rap songs, CDs, pot-bellied pigs, relationship advice, all these different terms that are normal terms any of us may use, but they're used in context in these calls that if you're listening to the conversation, do not make any sense. For example, in the calls, the defendant and Catherine McManwell don't outright debate the pros and cons of whether they should pay this blackmailer. Instead, they talk about the fact that this property is cheap. They might expect a property like this to even be a million dollars. This property seems like a great deal, but if you get the wrong tenant in there, the tenant may keep increasing the rent and that tenant may become a leech that never leaves you. So it will be up to y'all to decide. 
whether this defendant is actually worried about a future tenant of a property that might raise the rent and pay him more money, or if the defendant is actually worried that if he pays off the blackmailer, then the blackmailer may continue to come back again and again, or send a cousin or a friend to become a leech that never leaves him, that he can't get rid of. In another of these calls, the defendant tells Catherine McManwell that whoever this person is, this blackmailer is, he's got a lot of effing details. And in another, they discuss the fact that this blackmailer is not from the inside. And the defendant says that this guy is probably not from the first layer, but the second layer. So not someone who got info from Garcia, but maybe who's somebody who got info from Rivera. But one fact, and let me just say, as the jury, you all will interpret and decide what they're really talking about in these calls. Only y'all can determine the meaning and the weight to give this evidence. And only you can separate just mere coincidences from evidence in a conspiracy. But one fact, though, is really clear throughout these calls is that all of these conspirators are hopeful that this blackmailer is law enforcement just trying to get information. Because they think if it's law enforcement and the police don't have enough to bring charges, just fishing for information versus the other possibility, which would obviously be much worse for them, that the Adelsons are being blackmailed by somebody who actually knows inside information about their roles in Dan Markell's murder and may tell the police what they know. So after this undercover operation, which was in 2016, Luis Rivera, Sigfredo Garcia, and Catherine McVanua uh, are, are arrested. They're charged with the same charges before y'all in this trial. And Luis Rivera ended up cutting a deal with the state to tell law enforcement the truth about the murder of Dan Markell and the people responsible. Rivera told law enforcement that he was hired by Sigfredo Garcia to help kill Dan Markell. And Rivera described how Garcia told him that Catherine Magbanua, the mother of Garcia's children, secured this job for them. And the job was in Tallahassee and it paid $100,000, with Rivera's being cut being about a third of it, $35,000. <clears> Rivera explained that he and Garcia actually made two trips to Tallahassee with the intent of killing Dan Markell. The first one was a month before the murder. It was in June of 2014. And the second was when Dan Markell was actually killed in July of 2014. Rivera said that he bought a gun off the street for that second trip and Garcia rented a car. I'm oh, sorry, for the June trip. Uh, Rivera bought a gun off the street and Garcia rented the car for that trip. Garcia and Rivera did some scouting on that trip of Dan Markell's residence, some surveillance but ultimately couldn't get the job done. They ended head heading back to Miami. Um, during the trip to Tallahassee, he said that Garcia had a piece of paper with a picture of the man that they were supposed to kill on it and some handwritten notes as well. Cell phone records corroborated Rivera's information about the June trip. <clears throat> Rivera also told a story about an incident in Tallahassee where he and Garcia were riding down the road in the rented Prius and Garcia accidentally discharged the murder weapon and the bullet struck the floorboard of the Prius. Law enforcement tracked down that actual Prius again and were able to see evidence in the undercarriage that corroborated Rivera's information about the accidental discharge. So they're looking at the phone evidence or trying to find whatever they can to kind of um, corroborate what he's telling them. I mentioned earlier that both men, Garcia and Rivera, cut their phones off from the time that they left Premier and kept them off until well after the murder when they're on their way back home. Rivera said that the first call that either of them made after the homicide 
was from Garcia to Magbanwa, where Garcia told her that the job was done. And Magbanwa assured them <clears throat> that they would get their money the next day, which they did. Rivera says when Catherine Magbanwa brought cash to him at his home. And all this information that Luis Rivera provided them was corroborated by, including when the money was dropped off, was corroborated by cell phone records in this case. Luis Rivera told police that the next day after the murder, he was paid in cash by Catherine Magbanwa and that the money was packaged in a very unusual way. The money was in stacks of $100 bills and the money was stapled together. The stacks of 100s, every thousand dollars was stapled together. During this trial, y'all will hear that the defendant had access to a lot of cash and nothing's wrong with that. He had a lot of cash because his family gives cash discounts at their dental practice and he keeps the cash that he receives in a safe. Again, nothing wrong about that either. However, what is relevant in this case is that the defendant had a very unusual practice of keeping the cash in his safe in thousand dollar stacks of one hundred dollar bills that were stapled together, just like the money Luis Rivera received. Over the last few years, since the 2016 arrest and interview of Luis Rivera, Rivera, law enforcement has not stopped working on this case. There were trials in 2019 and 2022, so right before the pandemic and right after the pandemic, of co-conspirators. Law enforcement also continued to try to gather all the evidence that they possibly could. They continued to interview people who may possibly have any information about the case. They tried to clarify any audio recordings that couldn't be clearly heard. While the phone wiretaps are very clear, the wiretap conversations that took place in public places when these people were meeting in person were not clearly audible back in 2016. Some still aren't but because these public places are often too noisy. For instance, the recording of the conversation between the defendant and Catherine McManua and Dolce Vita had too much background noise to be able to clearly hear what the conspirators were talking about. However, since 2016, as technology developed over the years, and um, thanks to law enforcement's just continued dedication, law enforcement eventually found an expert that was formerly employed by the CIA with improved technology and enough expertise to clarify this recording at Dolce Vita that y'all will hear. And he did that by being able to reduce as much background noise as possible. And once this recording was clarified, which was actually just early last year in 2022, the state arrested this defendant. The presentation of this evidence, as y'all can see from opening, it's a lot. It's a lot of information. It's going to take a little bit of time, and it may be tedious at times. And I want to thank y'all in advance for the careful attention uh, to all of the evidence y'all see in here during this trial. When you'll do, you'll see that this defendant carried out his plan to hire a hitman to kill Dan Markell. He conspired and he solicited Catherine McManua to get this murder done. And he paid her for the job once it was completed. This defendant acted in furtherance of this murder plot that went beyond just thinking about it or talking about it. And these acts make him guilty as a principal to first degree murder just as if he pulled the trigger himself. While the defendant's choices helped solve a problem within his family, they came at a very high price. He took the life of a loving father of two little boys, and he caused a lifetime of grief for Dan Markell's loved ones. Y'all heard a lot in jury selection about how important this trial is to the defendant, which I'm sure it is. But Dan Markell was loved. He was a brother. He was a son. 
And this trial is his family's opportunity to see justice done for the person who set up their son's murder. And at the conclusion of this evidence, y'all will be convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that this defendant is guilty. And at that point, we'll ask you for the only verdict that does justice in this case, which is a verdict that the defendant is guilty as charged. Thank y'all. Is the defense prepared to give us a statement? Yes, Your Honor. You may proceed. Judge, we just need one moment to fix why. Go ahead. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Good morning. I didn't get to talk to you that much the last couple of days. My name is Dan Rathbon, and with me is Kate Myers, and we represent Charlie Avison. Now, let me start by saying the obvious. The murder of Professor Markell was a tragedy. The world lost a brilliant legal mind. His family lost a son and a brother. This community lost its sense of security and lost a good citizen. And his two boys, the nephews of Charlie Adelson, lost a loving father. His senseless murder continues to be felt throughout this community and others. It was inexcusable despicable, evil. But what I'm going to tell you today is what actually happened. You will see that Charlie Adelson had nothing to do with the murder of Professor Markham. You will see that the state cannot come close to meeting its burden. Why? Because Charlie Adelson is innocent. Now, I don't have to prove innocence. But what I'm telling you, I very rarely say in a courtroom as a defense lawyer, 
Charlie Adelson is innocent. And we'll get there. But the next thing I'm going to tell you, I also rarely say in a courtroom. And you may be surprised to hear this from a defense lawyer. I have great respect for the prosecutors and law enforcement on this case. I have admiration for their efforts after the murder of Professor Markell in trying to find out who did it. You will see that they spent countless man hours cell phone tower dumps, surveillance videos from a boatload of places, buses, cameras on the street, great law enforcement activity. And it paid off. They got the three killers. They convicted him. Sigfredo Garcia, convicted for life. Luis Rivera, Catherine Magbanua, convicted for life. Problem is, as you just heard, the state saw no connection between these people and Professor Markell. So from the very outset, the state suspected the Adelsons, the family. You saw the chart. It wasn't limited to Charlie Adelson. Unindicted co-conspirators in this case, the state has said it, Wendy Adelson, Donna Adelson, Harvey Adelson. The state knew, as you heard, that Wendy Adelson and Professor Markell had gone through a brutal divorce. And you're going to see it. But they couldn't find the connection. But then they had their aha moment. As you heard, they determined that at the time of the murder in 2014, Charlie Adelson was dating Catherine McBanwell. And they learned that Catherine McBanwell had had a previous relationship on again, off again with Sigfredo Garcia. They learned that Sigfredo Garcia and Catherine McBanwell shared two children together. They had their connection. The problem is, that's where the state began to guess, began to make assumptions. And you will see, we will show it, that those assumptions didn't make sense. I love jigsaw puzzles. I've loved them since I'm young. The reason why I love them is because they only work if every piece fits. No matter what you do with the jigsaw puzzle, if a piece doesn't fit, it becomes a mess. You can't hammer it. And you can't ignore it, because if you ignore it, you have holes in the puzzle. What you're going to see is with regards to this case, that's exactly what the state tried to do. They heard things, they saw things, but there were problems. They couldn't fit all the pieces together under their theories, their theories that they told you about today, 
I'm going to show you how those puzzles, those pieces, they didn't fit. They don't fit. And why? Respectfully, the state does not know what happened on July 18th, 2014. On that day, two crimes occurred. The first one, the state knows about, and that was the brutal murder of Professor Markell. The other one, they don't know about. They're about to find out like you. Because that day would forever change Charlie Adelson's life. But before we get there, I like cliffhangers. It's important to give you some background and timeline of the events. Charlie Adelson is 46 years old, single with a young son. He grew up in South Florida, in Coral Springs, in Broward County. His father was a dentist, a local dentist. It wasn't the Adelson Institute when Charlie was growing up. It was a small dental practice with his dad. Charlie is the middle child of three. He is very close with his parents. As they said, he is very close with his mom. Growing up, the family was middle class. And Charlie was not particularly close with either of his siblings. He grew closer with Wendy as they got older. He went to college at the University of Central Florida, went to dental school in South Florida, and then periodontic school. When he graduated as a periodontist, he had an idea. For work in his own practice, he figured that he could travel around to dental practices all over South Florida he would be a traveling periodontist. So what you are gonna learn in this case is that Charlie Adelson had practices from the very south of South Florida to as far places as Jupiter. He was in the car sometimes for hours in the day. And he worked a lot, you're gonna see that. He was a workaholic. He spent a lot of time in that car. And what did he do when he was in the car to pass the time? He spoke a lot on the phone. He would talk to whoever would listen to him. And you're gonna see in this case, this is one thing we won't deny, Charlie Adelson likes to talk. And he likes to repeat himself. And who would he speak with the most? He'd speak with his girlfriend. He'd speak with his mom. He'd speak with his friends. Now, Wendy Adelson, who's a state witness, followed a different path. She went to a prestigious university in Boston. She then went to school in England on a Truman Fellowship. And later, went to law school. She got scholarships for law school and college. Soon after starting law school, she met Dan Markell, and they fell in love. They got married. They ultimately moved to Tallahassee, where they both worked for FSU, Professor Markell as a law professor of the law school. Charlie Adelson didn't have much to do with either Professor Markell or Wendy during their marriage or before their marriage. 
He would talk to his sister periodically, maybe once every two or three weeks. They lived in Tallahassee for years. Charlie Adelson visited him in Tallahassee two, maybe three times. Charlie loved his sister. He sought advice from her as she did with him every once in a while. But they weren't super close. They were brother-sister. The truth is that Charlie Adelson was a little self-centered. He was building his career. See, that traveling periodontist, in the beginning, it wasn't that successful. But by the time of this case, in the 2013-2014 time period, you're going to see that Charlie Adelson was making a lot of money. His practice was booming. He was working six, sometimes seven days a week. You'll see it on the wires. You'll see it in text messages. He would start his day early in the morning, and most days he wouldn't get home till eight, nine, ten at night. At the time when this murder occurred, he was not married. He had no kids. He had a lot of money. And he was living a very good life. Now, in 2012, Wendy Adelson, on a trip down to South Florida, confides in her brother that she was having problems in her marriage. She told Charlie that she and Professor Markell had been going through marriage counseling. She asked him what he thought. He said, look, I want you to be happy, but you have to do what's best for you. I'm here to listen. But Charlie had no involvement whatsoever in Wendy's decision to divorce Professor Markell. You'll hear that. And in September of 2012, Wendy filed for divorce. And you're going to hear about how she filed for the divorce, and you're going to learn that Charlie had no involvement in her leaving the house, had nothing to do with him. <laughs> but we got to talk about TVs. And you're going to hear a lot about TVs in this case. Excuse me. See, Charlie has a really bad history of telling bad jokes. So when Wendy left the house, his mom told him that she didn't have a TV. He asked her, he said, what can I do to help Wendy? She's moved to a new place. She's left most of the stuff behind. What can I do to help? And his mom said, she didn't have a TV. He said, okay, when you go to Tallahassee, go to Best Buy, buy a TV for Wendy, and I'll pay you for it. And so Wendy got the TV, and she called Charlie. This is back in 2012. The murders in 2014. And she thanked him for the TV. And he didn't say he looked into hiring a hitman. He joked, a bad joke. And he said it was cheaper than hiring a hitman. Now, not only was it a bad joke, but you're going to hear in this trial, Charlie repeated the joke. 
He repeated it a lot to a lot of people. You're going to hear that he repeated it as late as March of 2014. So the man that they think hired a hitman is joking to others about hiring a hitman. Puzzle pieces. And you're going to learn why his repeating of that joke is going to be so important. I'm going to tell you in a little bit. Keep in the back of your mind. But let's first go back to the divorce. The divorce was bitter. It was emotional. Wendy Adelson and Professor Markell, they'd have good times. But when things were bad, they would fight about everything. And in January of 2013, Wendy Adelson filed a motion to relocate to South Florida with her two boys. That motion was opposed by Professor Markell. Now what you're going to learn in this trial is that Wendy Adelson never thought that motion would be granted. Her lawyer told her that motion would never be granted. But she said, let's give it a shot. Charlie had very little to do with the motion. He knew she was filing it. He knew she didn't have much chance of getting it. And the motion was denied. When it was denied, it didn't change Charlie Adelson's life one bit. But unlike Charlie, his mom and dad were upset. They were upset because their daughter had a job opportunity in South Florida. She had no family support in Tallahassee and they wanted her home. And you will see that Don and Harvey Adelson are very involved in their children's lives. We won't run away from that. You will see that Donna Adelson and Harvey came up with a lot of crazy ideas. I mean crazy ideas. You're going to see them. You've heard about some of them. When they show you those crazy ideas, take a look if any of them includes murder. Doesn't. Take a look at any of those crazy ideas. Include anything illegal. It doesn't. Take a look at if they're actually then go to lawyers to make sure that their ideas are legal. Murderers. You heard it. Unindicted co-conspirators going to lawyers to make sure that what they're offering is allowed. You're going to see that. But the ideas were crazy. You're going to read the emails. A lot of emotion. A mother-in-law, a grandmother with a lot of emotion. And you're going to see that Wendy Adelson, she rejected them. She rejected the ideas. They were never presented to Dan Markell. And then you're going to see that there was another idea. They have mentioned it in their opening, but they don't understand the importance of it. See, at one point in time, Donna Adelson and Harvey Adelson came with an idea to pay Professor Markell $1 million to allow their daughter to relocate. And they went to Charlie, who frankly by this point in time had more money than them. And they said, will you lend your sister a third of a million dollars? 
she'll pay you back or we'll pay you back. And he said, sure. And you're going to see that they presented this idea to Wendy Adelson. And the idea wasn't to take the boys out of Professor Markell's life. The idea was that with the million dollars, if Professor Markell agreed, he could live in South Florida and commute back and forth to Tallahassee. He could work out his schedule. He didn't teach every day of the week. He could work out his schedule so that he could still teach at the university and go back and forth. You're going to see that Wendy Adelson never made that offer. But it's very important. Like the joke, I want you to put it in your back of your mind for now. Let's fast forward to October 2013. October 2013, Charlie started dating Catherine Magbanua. We'll call her Katie. She was beautiful. She was smart. Like Charlie, she graduated from UCF. She was hardworking. He met her in one of the dental practices. At first, the relationship was casual. They wanted it that way. Charlie particularly liked it and liked Katie because she had two children. He worked a lot. His priority was his job. And Katie didn't bother him a lot. He only saw her like once, maybe twice a week. That's what he liked. And she was smart. She was fun. And he treated her very well. And that was very different, you'll learn, from how she was treated previously. Now, you'll hear that he spent a lot of time with Katie over the months that they dated. And remember how I told you Charlie talks a lot and repeats himself a lot? Well, when they were together, he did just that. He talked about his day. He talked about what was going on in the world. He talked about his family, which, by the way, was a constant topic every single day. Because when Charlie's driving in the car every morning for an hour to work and an hour home, sometimes longer, he talked to his mom on the phone. And when he talked to his mom on the phone, what would be a topic of heavy conversation quite frequently? Wendy's divorce. All the problems in the divorce. They told you that. They told you that in opening. And what would Charlie do? He would tell these things to his girlfriend. And what were the, some of the things he told her? Well, he told her about the million dollar offer. He told her that he could pay it in cash. She said, that's a lot of money. He said, no, I have it in, have it in cash and I'm gonna get it back. He told her several times the joke. Over time, you're gonna see through text messages that Katie wanted a deeper relationship and you'll see that Charlie didn't want that you'll also learn and the timeline is important they meet in September uh, they, they, they start dating in October of 13 you're going to see that over time, it takes a couple months, Charlie starts to learn a little bit more about Katie's ex, Sigfredo Garcia. And what you're going to learn is that Charlie Adelson 
never meets Sigfredo Garcia officially, but by all accounts, he was not a good guy. Violent. Long criminal history. Sigfredo Garcia and Katie had been high school boyfriend, girlfriend. And Katie was the love of Sigfredo's life. He lived for her. And you're going to see that Sigfredo Garcia hated Charlie Adelson. Puzzle pieces. So let me let me repeat it. You saw their chart. The shooter of Professor Markel. The man who murdered him. Hated Charlie Adelson. According to them, his co-conspirator. And you're gonna hear not from our witnesses, from their own witnesses, that he wanted to kill Charlie Adelson. You're going to hear that in March of 2014, just seven or eight weeks before that first attempt of murder that they talk about, he tried to kill him. Puzzle pieces. You're also going to hear about a phone call on July 1, 2014. You're going to actually hear that that July 1, 2014 call is how they found these guys. It's actually the craziest fact in this entire case, and there's a lot of crazy facts. You're going to hear that on July 1, 2014, Sigfredo Garcia made a call to the cell phone number of Harvey Adelson. It's the only call that helped investigators connect these folks to the Adelsons in the beginning. Actually broke the case. What they don't know, what you're gonna see, it's in text messages, it's discussed on the wires. They don't know it because they don't understand it because they weren't there. Is that on July 1st, 2014, just three weeks or so after the first murder attempt. And by the way, just 17 days before the murder. Let me repeat that. The murder happens on July 18, 2014. On July 1st, 2014, Sigfredo Garcia tries to run Charlie off the road. He threatens him. And what you're going to hear is that on July 1, he's so upset that he calls the Adelson Institute. Now, he doesn't realize that Charlie isn't the doctor at the Adelson Institute. He just comes in and out of the place. So he gets their voicemail machine. And you know how dentists are? They say in an emergency, call a cell phone number. They, they take your call at home on the cell phone number. Well, he hears in an emergency call Dr. Adelson at such and such number. He thinks he's calling Charlie Adelson, but he calls Harvey Adelson. And he calls him and he threatens him. He tells him, if you keep dating Katie, we're going to go mano y mano. I'm going to kill you. 17 days before, according to them, he conspired with this man to kill Professor Markell. What you're going to learn 
is that in the spring of 2014, it became apparent to Katie that her dreams of financial security with Charlie were not going to work out. You will learn that Katie heard the hitman joke. You will learn that she heard the million dollar offer and she got some ideas in her head. The state itself has called Catherine Magbanawa the mastermind. And that's exactly what she was. So now let's get to July 18th. I kept you waiting long enough. The June attempt didn't happen because Rivera didn't want to kill Dan Markell when his boys were around. See, what you're going to learn is during that June attempt on June 4th, 5th, Professor Markell had custody of the boys. You're going to learn that Professor Markell and Wendy Adelson shared custody 50-50. But you're going to learn that the state thinks Wendy Adelson was involved with her brother in a murder for hire. And she chose for the killers to kill her ex-husband when he had custody of her kids. Puzzle pieces. So you're going to learn that Luis Rivera, who is a bad guy, he had some conscience somewhere. He didn't want to do it in front of the kids. So they came back. By the way, on July 18th, who had custody of the kids when the murder actually happened? Professor Markell. You're going to hear he dropped them off at school. But this family who did this so that their grandchildren could be with them were going to risk for two hired hitmen to go up when he had custody of the kids. Puzzle pieces. July 18th for Charlie starts as a normal day. He works. You're going to see he lives in Fort Lauderdale. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with South Florida, so I'm going to give you a little bit of geography lesson. He lives in Fort Lauderdale. That day he's working in two offices because he'd often work in two offices a day. He'd work in the morning at one place and the afternoon at another. So he's working in two offices. The first office he's working in, both of them actually, are in Jupiter, Florida. Now, if you're familiar with South Florida, Fort Lauderdale and Jupiter are not close. With South Florida traffic in the morning, he was in the car for at least two hours. Now, he came home late that night, you're going to hear, so traffic was a little bit better, but it's probably still an hour to an hour and a half. Jupiter is north of Palm Beach. When I drive up here and I hit Jupiter, I know I'm about a third of the way here. That's a good way to look at it. If you live in Fort Lauderdale, when you hit Jupiter, you're one third done. He's in the car and He's talking on the phone. And you're going to see it. We're going to show you what the phone calls are about. He talks to his sister. Talks to his mom. Talks to his girlfriend. We'll talk to you about it. There, there, there are phone calls. You're going to see it. There are a lot of phone calls. And there are a lot of phone calls to his girlfriend. And there are a lot of phone calls to his mom. We're not going to deny that. And he works in these two offices. 
And at around six, six o'clock, you'll see a text message that he's about to start a very long surgery, a big procedure. By the way, the text messages throughout the day are normal. Just after 7 p.m., he gets a call from his mom. And he's told that Professor Markell has been shot. And he's shocked. He's upset. His first reaction is, Wendy and the boys okay. He's supposed to have dinner originally with a friend that night. But earlier in the day, that changes, and he's supposed to have dinner with Katie. And you're going to hear that Katie and him had gotten in a fight a couple days earlier about dinners. You'll hear it. And what you'll learn is after he finds out what happened, he tells Katie he doesn't want to go to dinner. He leaves the office at around 8 o'clock in Jupiter. And you'll learn that Katie tells him she'll come to his house that night to comfort him. He, sh he shook up. Now, let me be clear. You're going to hear he wasn't close with Professor Markell. They weren't friends. They had nothing in common. But he shook up because Someone he knew, the father of his nephews, had been shot. When Katie arrived that night, and you're going to learn more details of how she gets there, what she has to do to get there. It's not planned. You're going to see that. The state's going to put on that evidence. You're going to learn that she's scrambling to get a babysitter. You're going to learn, by the way, that Charlie had seen her for lunch the day before. So if it's a murder for hire, why didn't she get the money then? Puzzle pieces. But you're going to learn that she gets there that night, sometime after 11. And when she gets there, she is frantic. She's upset. And he's scared because he's never seen her this way. And she sits him down and she tells him something terrible has happened. She says that a friend of hers had shot Professor Markell. She tells him over and over that she had nothing to do with it. But these people, she was talking too much. And her friend and these people learned about the problems that his family was having with Professor Markell. They learned about the million dollar offer. And they got it in their minds to do this. As you can imagine, Charlie is, his life has just forever been altered. He asks, who are these people? She won't tell him. It's not safe for you to know. He's screaming at her. She won't tell him. Charlie had a guess. You will hear in detail what happened that night. You will learn that Charlie Adelson was told if he didn't pay within the next 48 hours, he or one of his family members would be next. You will learn that Katie repeatedly said that she had nothing to do with it and acted distraught. You will hear how she said that she would help him. You will learn about the initial payment. It wasn't $100,000. It was more than $100,000. He had, took out everything he had in his safe. You're going to learn about that. The state doesn't know it. It was more money. But you're going to learn he didn't have a third of a million dollars.
So he had to pay every month. They don't know about that either. Payments every month. Does that sound like a murder for hire? Or does that sound like extortion? You're going to hear about these gifts. And you're going to learn that the gifts were just that. They were gifts. Because as time went on, he became more and more certain that Katie was not involved. He became more and more certain that she was helping him. And he wanted to keep her happy too because he needed her. He needed her help. And you will hear that the payments changed a couple months after the night of the extortion. Two crimes. You'll hear that the payments changed and that Katie was put on the books of the Adelson Institute. Paper trail. They created a paper trail. Puzzles don't fit. Pieces of the puzzle don't fit. And you'll hear that in order to put her on the books, despite Katie telling him the night of July 18th, you can never talk about this with anyone. You can never talk on the phone about this. You can never talk about it in public. You can never talk about it anywhere. Because if they find out, they will kill you and your family. If they think the police are coming to you to talk to you, they will kill you. Look at what they did to Professor Markell. But you will hear that he told someone. He had to. He told his mom. You'll learn that she was the bookkeeper for the Dental Institute. You'll learn why he had to tell her. You'll learn about those checks. They've never been able to understand why are they so sequential? Why are they back and forth? You'll learn why. They talk about the bump in 2016. What I like to call is the second extortion. What they don't realize is that their undercover operation was an extortion on an extortion. They don't know it. It's not their fault. And we're going to go through the wires with you. We're going to go through Dolce Vita with you. And we're going to show you how they actually prove his innocence. We're going to show you how they are talking carefully. They're talking to him. He's talking about an extortion. They're happy if this bump is the police. Because if it's the police, none of them are going to get killed. If it's a bad guy, they're in danger. If you do a murder with someone, the last person in the world you want this bump to be is the police. Because it means they're on to you. Puzzle pieces. Not from the first layer, she says, but from the second layer. I got goosebumps when she said it. It's one of my favorite lines in the recording. Not from the first layer, the first extortion, but from the second layer. 20 months later is the bump. That's the second layer to Charlie Edelson at that point in time. You will also see 
And what's going to be weird about this case, ladies and gentlemen, and you're going to start to see it today, much of their case, I agree about. They're going to put witnesses up there. I'm not going to ask them one question. Some of their evidence is exactly the truth. It just doesn't prove a murder. The stapled money, it's his money. You will also see that Sigfredo Garcia was arrested on May 25, 2016. You will see that Luis Rivera was arrested on June 2, 2016. You will see that Catherine Magbanawa was arrested on October 1, 2016. Guess who wasn't arrested? Charlie Adelson. He wasn't arrested for six more years. And what you're going to see is that they have the exact same evidence in 2016 against Charlie Adelson that they do today. The same liars. They talk about an enhanced Dolce Vita recording. You're going to get both recordings. You determine if it, you can hear anything better. See, the Kate, state's case against Charlie Adelson is a case of assumptions. It's a case of guesses was not brought until weeks before Katie Magbana was trial. You can ask yourself why. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to ask for your patience in this case. A man's life is in your hands. He's innocent. Send him home. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. before the first witness is called. The bailiff will escort you all into the jury. Please place your notepads face down on your chairs. For everyone observing in the gallery, I just wanted to provide you some instruction now that we're going to move into the actual witness presentation. If you leave the room while a witness is testifying, you'll need to remain outside the courtroom doors until the next witness changes. Please do not move about the room or distract the jury or the parties while the witnesses are testifying as well. 
We will be in recess until 11.15.